10 days ago, I've had a second talk with Connor Ryan. And in this talk, Connor Ryan mentioned an article published in Scientific American a few months ago. And this article captures the flux in the field of pathological narcissism. The fact that there are raging debates, one could even say wars, as to what constitutes a narcissist. Is narcissism overt and grandiose? Is narcissism covert and shy and vulnerable and fragile and, and passive aggressive? Is narcissism, pathological narcissism, some kind of compensation for a bad object, for a constellation of voices that inform the narcissist that he is unworthy and unlovable and inadequate and so on and so forth, inferiority complex? Or is narcissism the exact opposite? The belief, the firm belief and conviction that the narcissist is godlike, infallible, omniscient, omnipotent, and in general, a kind of divinity. There's a raging debate between clinicians in the field, therapists, psychologists, licensed social workers, psychiatrists, and theoreticians in academe, such as myself. But these are just two facets of the same coin. It's like the famous story with the elephant, where four wise men are blindfolded, or they are blind to start with, I don't remember, and they are instructed to describe an elephant. So one of them touches the elephant's legs, the other touches the elephant's trunk, the third one touches the elephant's um, tail, and the fourth one touches the elephant's expletive deleted. <laughs> so they come up with four different descriptions, but it's a single elephant. And the elephant in the room is the fact that clinicians are much more likely to come across narcissists who have hit rock bottom. They are much more likely to come across narcissists in crisis, in a life crisis. So they are much more likely to be exposed to the fragile, brittle nature of pathological narcissism. And they are much more likely to diagnose or misdiagnose their clients with covert, fragile, vulnerable, shy narcissism. So clinicians are exposed to covert narcissism, whereas theoreticians are exposed much more to the overt, grandiose, defiant, antisocial, pseudo-psychopathic face of pathological narcissism, the one captured essentially in the diagnostic criteria of the DSM. What we need to do is to reconcile these two views and to realize that all narcissists are sometimes overt and sometimes covert. When narcissists collapse, when they are unable to obtain supply, when they are mortified, when they are severely narcissistically injured, they tend to become covert for a while. And then they rebound and become overt again. So there's no type constancy, there's only type dominance. The overt narcissist is typically overt. A covert narcissist is typically covert. And yet they can switch places when life's exigencies, vicissitudes, and circumstances force them to confront their own shame, inadequacy, and delusionality. This is a very important uh, observation, because what we have done in the field of pathological narcissism, more generally in cluster B personality disorders, and definitely in personality disorders in general, is we over-specialize, we, we nitpick, we, we divide and subdivide and, and then divide again. And so we create niches, we create niche diagnosis, niche clinical entities, which do not conform to reality. Because we can't be put, we human beings cannot be put into a drawer. We are uh, unclassifiable, if you wish. We cannot be captured with definitions. We are in flux. We are like a river. And any clinician would tell you that a person may present with pathological narcissism on the first meeting and may even be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder only to emotionally dysregulate during the therapy 
and resemble a borderline and then transition to becoming a psychopath when he acts out and so on and so forth. We are all everything. We are all, we all, all mental patients and all clients and all people with mental health issues display a kaleidoscope, a panoply, a rainbow spectrum of all mental health issues. It's even the distinction between personality disorders and post-traumatic disorders is artificial. Even the distinction between personality disorders and mood disorders may be wrong, where mood disorders may be just a facet of personality disorders. We need to begin to have a holistic view of psychology. And this emerges from my talk with the inimitable, one and only one, Irish, if I recall correctly, Conor Ryan. So stay tuned and enjoy the show. And those of you who survived to the very end, let me know. Is wrong. I'm recording. Okay. Okay. Posterity awaits. I, I think I'm recording as well. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so Sam Vaknin, thank you so much. My most requested guest to come my back pleasure. and talk to again. The guest that has the most views on my um, my channel. Um, and people, people really want people to People must be you. traumatized over there. <laughs> I'd say they are. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so let's... I thought today what we would talk about is intimate relationships. We touched on it last time. And before we do that... We spoke in November of 2023. Are there any updates, any developments in that time period that have struck you, that have shocked you, that have changed your um, perspective? It's only been three and a half months. Anything, anything that springs to mind? I'm not sure in which sphere of life. What sphere of life are you referring to? But if you're referring to politics, for example, then there has definitely been a, a resurgence, not to say an insurgency, <laughs> of uh, narcissists, avowed narcissists, open narcissists, proud narcissists, people who have converted narcissism into an ideology, ironclad ideology with explicit values. Um, I've just read an article by a lady in, in France. She published a book and she says, you need to be selfish. You need never have children. You need never get married. You, and she was talking to a, a female uh, kind of uh, audience or public. And that's, a, that's an example. And she's, she's featured and celebrated. She's like, yeah, you're right, girl. I mean, go for it. And, and so that's one example. And then, of course, you have the likes of Trump and others in Argentina and in Israel, in Turkey, in, I mean, you name it, there's a, a, a murky wave of narcissism washing all over us. And I think the difference lately is the narcissism started off as a clinical entity, mental health issue. Then it became an organizing principle of life. Then it became an explanatory principle. You, you made sense of reality uh, through narcissism. You said, for example, this guy is a narcissist. That explains his behavior. You know, um, politicians, people in show business, um, entertainment industry. I mean, so narcissism helped you to uh, to decipher the world. It became an explanatory principle. But now narcissism is becoming the equivalent of a religion or an ideology. If you are secular, secular minded, you know, it's no longer an organized. It's a prescriptive prescriptive discipline. It tells you what to do in order, for example, to succeed. So you have coaches and so on online, names withheld, and they tell you, be a narcissist. Like, and you have even, I think I mentioned it last time, you, you even have pretty respectable magazines such as Scientific American, um, I'm sorry, New Scientist. And they came up with a cover story, parents teach your children to be narcissists in July, 2016. So it, 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 is transition, it has transitioned from the periphery into the mainstream. And now narcissism is bon ton. Narcissism guarantees success and accomplishments. Narcissism is, uh, uh, leads to self-efficacy. If you're not a narcissist, something's wrong with you. 
For example, if you're not selfish, you're altruistic, you're charitable, you're so so either you are virtue signaling, you're fake, you're being fake, or something's wrong with you because you should put yourself first. And so you need therapy. And and so but narcissism is permeating academe and literature. And now you have a whole class of respectable scholars who say that psychopathy and narcissism are the next stage in evolution. That high functioning narcissism and high functioning psychopathy is socially beneficial. Um, and so on and so forth. So if you if you regard narcissism as a kind of inevitable byproduct of human progress and, and human development and evolution, then you know you, you accept it, that's it. But if you don't, if you if you realize, like I do, that narcissism is an aberration, a malignancy, then it's really terrifying to watch narcissism um, take over its tentacles. Its tentacles are all over. It's like a horror movie. It's like an alien invasion or something. It's terrifying. Yeah. Um, it, it was an article relatively recently that came up in the appeared in the Scientific American and a clinical psychologist at McLean Hospital in Massachusetts, Elsa Ronningston, was quoted as, as follows. Pathological narcissism is characterized by an inability to maintain a steady sense of self-esteem. Those with this condi condition protect an inflated view of themselves at the expense of others. When that view is threatened, they experience anger, shame, envy, and other negative emotions. Now, what I'm hearing, and I want to get your perspective on that as well, is the people in the, their orbit are going to suffer, right? Yes. Um, is there anything that you would add to that or disagree with that? Well, it's a partial. It's, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a rolling stone. It is a true authority, <laughs> not a fake YouTuber who claims to be an authority, but a true authority. Uh, she has been working in the field of Nazism since the early 1990s, started together, I mean, I, I started at the same time, and she's been working since then. She published seminal, seminal works on Nazism already in 1996, for example. And she is a true, she knows what she's talking about. But her description of Nazism is geared towards a popular audience. So it, it's more relational. It's like what narcissism would do to you. Mm. Beware of narcissism, you know, kind of thing. Narcissism is a lot more complex. These are the outside, the external manifestations of internal dynamics, which are exceedingly complex and potentially the most complex we know of. Uh, at least someone like Otto Kernberg thought so. He thought that borderline and narcissistic personality uh, disorders or disorders of the self are so complex that they are at times indistinguishable from psychosis or psychotic disorders. It's a really, really bad thing. Narcissistic personality is, is not just being about being an a-hole or a jerk. <laughs> it's really bad out there so or in there. So for example, the narcissist is unable to tell that other people are separate from him, that they're external, which is an utterly psychotic feature. Um, consequently, he treats other people as extensions or instruments or tools, you know. The narcissist imposes a fantasy defense on reality. He divorces reality and he supplants it. He replaces it with fantasy. That's okay. But then he tries to coerce you into fitting into this fantasy and affirming it. And if you refu if refuse to confirm, to tell him that the fantasy is not fantasy, <laughs> Or if you refuse to play a role according to his fantasy script, you're penalized. He becomes aggressive and he, you know, it's, it could escalate and end very badly. So these are two examples of how people around the narcissist are affected. I think if you're looking for a metaphor, the narcissist is a black hole. Now, I'm a physicist by training. I have a PhD in physics. So a black hole, you can't see a black hole. The only thing that comes out of a black hole is some kind of tenuous radiation, which is literally undetectable. Light cannot escape a black hole, so you can never see a black hole. But what do you see? What do you, how do you know there's a black hole out there? Because everything around the black hole misbehaves. Everyone around the black hole is in, in some kind of crazy-making cycle. <laughs> Uh, all kinds of stars and all kinds of galaxies and all kinds of, uh, you know, every, everyone goes haywire 
around the black hole. And that tells you there's a black hole there. The narcissist is the same. Even if you are unable to diagnose someone with narcissism because you need tests and structured interviews and so on, still the reactions of people around the narcissist ought to tell you that something is wrong with this person because he he dysregulates other people. Narcissist, I'm saying he, it's a she, half of all narcissists are women. Narcissists dysregulate other people. They they remove their, they strip away the, the defenses that other people have built, lifetime of defenses, habits, everything breaks down. Narciss when the narcissist enters the scene, there's a collective meltdown, not only of individuals, but of institutions. Have a look at Donald Trump, for example. You know, there's an institutional meltdown. Everything melts down. And so um, there's this issue of, uh, being unable to recognize the externality and separateness of other people. It's known as an othering problem. Another issue, for example, which she alluded to, is that the narciss narcissism is a disruption in the formation of a self. There's a problem. The self is not fully integrated, not fully formed. It's as if the narcissist is a kind of a kaleidoscope with all kinds of shards flying in space and there's no, nothing coalesced into a core identity. The narcissist is trying to compensate for this by pretending to be someone who is, who is not, which is a false self. And then he comes to you and says, I am this false self, right? And if you say, no, you're not this false self, he beats you on the head. Or metaphorically speaking. And sometimes not metaphorically. <laughs> so uh, this lack of core, of course, does not allow the narcissist to regulate his sense of self-worth. Isa Ronningston uses the term self-esteem. It's misleading. It's not self-esteem. It's self-worth. Self-worth is comprised of self-esteem and self-confidence and self-efficacy and many other selves. When you don't have a self, anything that starts with self is absent. Like self-esteem, you can't have self-esteem. You don't have self. Self-worth, you, you, you can't gauge your worth. You don't know if you're worthy, not worthy, and so on. So we often say that narcissists have uh, distorted internal objects. For example, the vast majority of healthy people, they have something called good object. A good object is um, a, a group of voices, constellation or coalition of voices, internal voices, that keep informing you that you're okay. You know, you're lovable, you're doing well, everything is okay. Uh, you have your shortcomings, you have your limitations, you have your deficiencies and lacks, you need to work on it. So you are given a realistic assessment of who you are, which is part good and part bad. In other words, there's no splitting. You're, you're integrated. You're the shades of gray. This is a good object. The narcissist, non-narcissist, has a good object. All narcissists are divided into two groups. One group has what is known as a bad object. A bad object is a group of voices, coalition, constellation of voices. They're known as introjects. And these voices internally keep informing this kind of narcissist, you're bad, you're unworthy, you're inadequate, you're a loser, you're a failure, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're unlovable. And the, this kind of narcissist tries to compensate, to silence these voices by pretending to be the exact opposite of what these voices are saying. If the voices are saying you're not lovable, this narcissist is going to counter and say, I'm not only lovable, I'm irresistible. Or if they say you're stupid, the Nazi is going to say, I'm a genius. I'm a genius professor of psychology, <laughs> for example. So uh, a bad object generates compensatory narcissism. But there's another type of object, which I, I find even more pernicious. And that is the idealized object. The idealized object is when a child is raised by his, or his parents or his or her parents. And the child is idolized pedestalized. The child can do no wrong. He's perfect. He's amazing. He's godlike. He's, you know. And this kind of child grows up to believe this. He believes this. He internalizes this, this object, this idealized object. And these are the really, really bad narcissists. These are the narcissists with no boundaries, no inhibitions, no adherence to social mores and norms and rules, nothing. In short, these are psychopathic narcissists, actually. They're a bit psychopathic. And 
a portion of these, a percentage of these narcissists are known as malignant narcissists. And malignant narcissists are really dangerous because malig a malignant narcissist is a narcissist at the core, although there's no core, but you, you know what I mean. At the basis is a narcissist, the foundation. And on top of that, like a wedding cake, you have a, a psychopathic layer and a sadistic layer, a sadist. And so this is the gift that keeps giving. If you are if you happen yourself to be, if you find yourself in the ambit or orbit of this kind of narcissism. So you can't reduce narcissism to three sentences in Scientific American. It's a hyper-complex phenomenon. You, know. um, you touched on it there, but I wanted to ask you about tips for the parent of a narcissist, a teenager diagnosed with NPD, right? Um, there was a book written many years ago where we talk about Kevin, um, which I think awakened the Western world um, to the issue. So what, what you're talking about there kind of extrapolates on this idea that a parent may have filled the child with a sense of their own magnificence, which could develop into something clinical. Would I be yeah, right? Well, first of all, to set the record straight, in the case of Kevin in the book, Kevin has been rejected by his mother. As a, as a baby, the exact opposite. She rejected him. She refused mm -hmm. to breastfeed him. She refused to touch him, even. Um, she she went through the equivalent of postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. And she kind of... So that's that's a case of bad object, actually. Not idealized object. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a perfect uh, reification of a bad object uh, situation. But yeah, if a child keeps getting told that he is that you know he is the embodiment of munificence and magnificence, and and especially if the child is denied access to reality, when you tell a child you can do no wrong, what you're telling the child is don't listen to reality, because reality pushes back. Reality is harsh. Reality keeps telling you you are mistaken or you're stupid or you should you know. And so the parent is informing the child, don't listen to reality. Reality is wrong. You're always right. And so this is to cut the child off reality. That's why it's abusive. Pampering, spoiling, pedestalizing, idolizing. These are forms of abuse. They're not good parenting. These kind of parents are also usually overprotective. So they isolate the child from peer groups. They don't allow the child to be exposed to peers. Or at least not meaningful. Or at homeschooling least would homeschooling come into that equation? Yeah, homeschooling could come into this, or you're not allowed to play out, or if, or I'm going to join you. So there are kinds of helicopter parents who kind of join the kid wherever the mm. kid goes. They're there, never, never give the, the kid alone time, especially not with peers. Uh, chastise and castigate and attack ro other role models such as teachers. So the teacher is always wrong teacher has some, you know, hates the kid, she's envious of the kid, or she's, you know, so they inject a streak of paranoia, paranoid ideation. So this kind of child is totally thwarted and distorted. And uh, it reminds me of uh, Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo wrote uh, a book, um, not of them. And um, in this book, he describes uh, a phenomenon which in the 19th century was quite prevalent, and they were known as compachicosi. Compachicosi were children who were abducted as babies by itinerants, gypsies, <laughs> sorry for the word. And then the children were inserted into bottles and they grew up inside the bottle and they took on the shape of the bottle. And then they, were, they became circus freaks and circus attractions. And they made, made a lot of money for their owners um, and so on. This was, this, uh, it was a real phenomenon. Copachicosis. What was that again, Sam? Tell me the name of that phenomenon. Copachicosis. Compachicosis. Compachicosis. So the, the, the child with an idealized object is mm -hmm. this kind of child. It is put in a bottle of the parent's making and it acquires the shape of the bottle. Now the parent projects onto this kind of child unfulfilled wishes, uh, expectations, spoken and unspoken. The parent dictates the child's behavior, micromanages the child, and instrumentalizes the child. The child's role is to bring glory to the parent. 
the parent uh, uh, secures narcissistic supply vicariously through the child. And the child is penalized. So the child learns, penalized if he fails. So the child learns to link love with performance. And he has a perception of love as tra totally transactional. So it's it's a really effed up child at, at the very end of this cycle. This And these kind of parents are as bad, as bad as parents who commit incest or you know, physical abuse or whatever, even to some extent more pernicious. Because one of the reasons, one of the reasons this kind of parenthood is a lot more threatened is because it's socially acceptable and even socially condoned. You know, we have this education system where every child is amazing, every child is perfect, every child is the greatest talent since Einstein, if not earlier. No child can do wrong. There are consolation prizes for everyone. Everyone is a winner. No one is a loser. And, and so on. So the education system, especially I must say in the United States, isolates children from reality and embeds them in a fantasy bubble of their own grandeur, grandeur their own, you know, the, the, this kind of education system fosters grandiosity as a cognitive distortion and, and collaborates in cahoots with parents who find this amazing, because they want, every parent wants to believe that their children are, you know, amazing and incredible, and super intelligent, and I know what. So there's a collusion here, a collusion to create a fantastic space where the child would never ever find who he truly is, who he truly is, warts and all. So it's really bad out there, because this practice, as I said, is part and parcel in the fabric of modern society and modern education and modern parenting skills and modern everything. Yeah, parents are told, your children are sensitive. You should never berate them. You should never shout at them. You should never, God forbid, beat them up <laughs> and so on. I strongly disagree. I think these are all pedag pedag pedagogical tools. They're all educational tools that should be available to a parent. Mm -hmm. I think the child should be confronted with reality. I think suffering and pain and loss are the greatest engines of personal development. And if you deny them to the child, he will never develop. But suffering is unavoidable. They will encounter pain, suffering when they go out into the world in any capacity, even in the playground. Okay. They're going to encounter. So that's why these kind of parents make sure that they don't have the opportunity to encounter losses. But you're right that once this child is out of the family, I don't know how to call it, nest, shall we say? Bubble. Bubble or whatever. Um, this kind of child is going to suffer um, disproportionately more than, you know, well, well constructed, well, well constellated children. So would you be recommend, recommending some kind of clinical intervention or some kind of therapeutic intervention or just coaching parents? Depends. First of all, it is extremely bad practice to diagnose narcissism, pathological narcissism, prior to age 21. And some authorities like Twenge and Campbell say 25. So we should, because the brain, for example, is not completed until age 25. Uh, critical parts of the brain are missing until age 25, including major executive functions. Second thing is grandiosity is a good, healthy thing in adolescence. Adolescents need to be grandiose in order to break away from the family and take on the world. You know, you need to be seriously grandiose to think at age 14 that you can succeed in the world or you can say goodbye to mommy and daddy. Mm -hmm. And that's healthy. That's good. Narcissism in, at this age, in adolescence, is actually adaptive. It's very good. So it's bad practice to diagnose narcissism prior to age 21, at the very least. Um, so why, why did I mention this? Because prior to age 25, even if you appear to be a narcissist, you are likely not a narcissist. You probably have a bad object or an idealized object or some problem with the externalization and all kinds of, th all kinds of things which are treatable, simply treatable. At around age 25, things begin to settle down, coalesce, and become fossilized and ossified. And after age 25, 
it's pretty hopeless. If you if you had acquired narcissistic personality disorder around the age of 25, are uh, you pretty much a lost case? And yeah, there are many self-interested, self-enriching uh, people online, offline, books, book authors, even with academic degrees, even with PhDs in psychology, who are lying, <laughs> simply lying, that pathological narcissism is treatable. Behavior, behaviors can be modified. You can modify the narcissist's behaviors by giving a variety of incentives, for example, by challenging the narcissist's grandiosity. You know, you can accomplish this, no? You can't. Do, do, you, are you that weak that you can't, you know? And then the narcissist, just to show you, to spite you, is, is kind of fulfills the therapeutic expectations. But otherwise, with the exception of minor behavior modification, modifications of abrasive behaviors, antisocial behaviors, which are minor and fleeting, they, the, this 100% remission <laughs> relapse after a while. With this exception, which is pitiable, you can't touch narcissism after 25, after age 25. You can't touch it. It's, uh, it's doomed. It's, it's, that's it. And this is the truth. This is the unvarnished truth that any clinician would tell you, you know, in four eyes, like in a pub, when he's a bit drunk. They would tell you, yeah, narcissists are hopeless. So um, in modern treatment today in 21st century, in 2024, those practitioners and clinicians that are treating people are offering treatment or diagnosing they are you're intimating that they are fully aware of course sir. that this is not true i say again you can use schema therapy you can use emdr you can use some forms of cbt there are definitely treatment modalities including kernberg's treatment modality transference therapy and so on. there are treatment modalities that do have an effect on narcissists for they mellow them they ameliorate the condition they reduce abrasive criminalized even, antisocial behaviors. I mean, yeah, you can kind of finesse the narcissist, fine-tune the narcissist somehow, but you can't touch the core. There's no healing there. Absolutely none. Zero, nothing. This conditioning is a form of conditioning. You challenge a narcissist's grandiosity, a narcissist will do anything. If you challenge a narcissist to be a moral person, he would become hyperboral. If you challenge him to be altru altruistic and charitable, for example, if there's a charity competition, if you organize a charity competition, you know, the narcissist would want to come on top by con making the greatest contribution in human history. So he would plunge five billion dollars just to show you that he is the greatest of them all. And then he would say, wow, what a charitable person, amazingly altruistic. No, it's just manipulation via grandiosity. You can make the narcissist do almost anything by challenging or leveraging the narcissist's cognitive distortions, the narcissist's sickness and pathology. And this raises the question, how ethical is this? For example, if you come across someone with psychosis and they believe that they are Jesus Christ or you know, a lesser figure like Napoleon, by agreeing with them, by colluding with the delusion, you can make them do things, you know? But it raises the question of ethics. When I was a very young man, which was when the last dinosaurs were dying, there was a guy in, in Israel, uh, Friedberg, and he invented an amazing way to treat par uh, what used to be called at the time paranoid schizophrenia. Amazing way. There was a guy who came, and I, I witnessed this particular occasion, this particular instance. There's a guy who came, and he said that the Mossad, which is the equivalent, equivalent of the CIA in Israel, he said that the Mossad was chasing him, was after him, was conspiring against him. They wanted to kill him and whatever. Of course, this was a case of paranoid schizophrenia, extreme mental illness. So what, what the therapist did, he organized a court. He created a court, a simulated court. And there was a, a judge and there was a prosecutor and the prosecutor was prosecuting the Mossad for persecuting the patient. And the patient is his own defense attorney. And there was a court, a trial. And the Mossad was found guilty and instructed by the judge to not persecute uh, the patient anymore. 
And this is a great way to assuage anxieties, paranoid ideation, and, and so on, so on, so on. But it does raise the question. I think it's, I personally feel it's unethical. It may be efficient. It may, it may reduce the patient's anxiety. Paranoid ideation may have a beneficial effect on the patient, but it perpetuates a pathology. And anything that perpetuates a pathology, in my view, is not okay. Morally, ethically, not okay. And today, the only way to treat narcissists is to perpetuate the pathology, even enhance it, amplify it. Is this ethical? I don't think so. Um, speaking of um, treatment, right, um, before we, we talk about treatment, let's talk about intimate relationships, um, because this seems to be the most triggering for people who are watching these videos. Um, the idea that you would embark upon an intimate relationship with somebody who's a narcissistic abuser, you may not know it, um, and all of a sudden you're knee deep in it. Um, would the narcissistic person have difficulty, say, pair bonding, for example, or would they just be like the rest of us? No. Forming the... As I, as I said earlier, narcissists are incapable of perceiving other people as external mm. or, or as separate. So the only form of relationship and the only form of intimacy a narcissist can have is, is with, not even with himself, because he has no self, but with structures, voices, objects inside himself. It's the only kind of intimacy, intimate relationship he can have. What he does in order to have an intimate relationship with you, he converts you into one of those objects or constructs or whatever you want to call it, inside mm -hmm. his mind. He introduces you into his mind. He insinuates you into his mind. And then he continues to interact with your representation in his mind. And so the narcissist um, defines himself and regulates himself through you. And in this, the narcissist is similar to, the, to someone with borderline personality disorder. He uses external regulation. So, for example, if the narcissist wants to feel great about himself, he wants to idealize himself, he will first idealize you. Because if you are ideal and the narcissist owns you, as an internal object that makes him ideal. For example, a narcissist would date a, a, a woman and he would say, she's drop dead gorgeous. She's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. By insisting on this, by idealizing her, what is he saying? He's saying, I'm the owner of a drop dead gorgeous object. I'm the owner of the most beautiful thing the world has ever seen. And that makes me special. That makes me unique. So even this, even the process of idealization is about the narcissist, not about you. It's like owning a, a car, a, a flashy car, or you know, it's a status symbol kind of. Mm. So narcissists interact only with themselves through you. Narcissists also need your gaze. They need to see themselves through your eyes. So they use your gaze to regulate themselves. But this is not a safe method. So what they do, they falsify your gaze. They attribute to you cognitions, thoughts, emotions, and so on, that you may not have at all. So they would say, for example, oh, he admires me. He thinks I'm a genius. Maybe you think I'm an idiot. Maybe what you truly think is that I'm a blowhard idiot. But I would, as a narcissist, I would attribute to you certain emotions and, and thoughts and, and beliefs and so on and so forth that are conducive to my own idealization and grandiosity. And there was no evidence to indicate that the person had those feelings in the first place. You know? it's, you're a placeholder. You're just mm -hmm. a placeholder. Uh, it's, it, this, there are massive processes of projection. The narcissist projects onto you parts of, of himself that he cannot tolerate, that he rejects. So you become a repository of the narcissist's bad emotions, bad object, self-castigation, self-criticism, self-rejection, self-loathing. They're all projected onto you. So if the narcissist is weak, he's not weak, you're weak. He attributes this to you. So this is called projection. 
narcissist splits you. One day you can do no wrong, the next day you are. You can do no right. All bad, all good. Black and white. This is called splitting. You are subjected to a roller coaster of totally infantile defenses. Defenses which are typical of infants, of babies. You know? And the narcissist instrumentalizes you to the maximum. You have a job. It's a job description. It's, it's not a, an intimate relation. You have a series of jobs. For example, you should recall the narcissist's moments of glory. And by recalling these moments of glory, you regulate the narcissist's flow of narcissistic supply. That's a job. Another job, you should confirm to the narcissist that his false self is not false and that his fantasy, the shared fantasy, is not fantasy. That's another, another job you have. And there are many others. And you're busy all the time. And it's exhausting. It's depleting. Because essentially you become a maintenance worker. And your maintenance job is to make sure that the fragile, brittle, breakable, vulnerable thing that is the narcissist, because it's not a self, it's a thing, mm -hmm. uh, is never impacted by reality. You're a buffer. You're a firewall. And if you don't do your job correctly, you're penalized very heavily. You're devalued. You know. So it's a transactional thing because, as you recall, the, the child who later becomes a narcissistic adult is exposed to transactional love. It's the only kind of love he knows. He associates love with performance and he associates love with pain. Pain or as a punitive thing. So this is the way he constructs a shared fantasy. And you are... So the, the, the base requirement from you is to not be, to suspend yourself and to reappear as a fictional character within a narrative that is self-aggrandizing and overprotective. A narrative whose main role is to prevent narcissistic injury or, God forbid, narcissistic modification. And you are the guardian of the narcissist. That's why I have this principle of dual mothership, where the narcissist actually tells you, you're going to be my mother and I'm going to be your mother. You're the mother. You're, you're the guardian. You're the custodian of the narcissist's uh, dangerous, life-threatening shame. It is your job to feed the narcissist with so much misinformation and fake news that will prevent him from ever getting in touch with his internal shame which could destroy him and kill him. So that would be narcissist. That's what they call narcissistic supply, right? Yes, that's narcissistic supply. And uh, you would be a source of narcissistic supply. And the narcissist would use the narcissistic supply to regulate his internal environment and to buttress the, the fortress that he has constructed around the shame, isolating it somehow. It's mainly shame. There are other negative effects and other negative emotions. Ilza Roning some mentioned them, like anger, envy, and so on. Narcissists are not capable of positive emotions at all. Not even one of them. Not love, not forget about all this. They're capable only of negative emotions. Well, that's quite interesting because that would intim intimate then that if somebody um, is experiencing love for another human being, that they couldn't possibly be... Uh... Unfortunately, we're heavily dependent on self-reporting. Mm. How would you verify that what this person is experiencing is love? There's no objective test or anything. It's totally one of, the, one of the funny things you see online in doing any research on narcissism is that people are always wondering, are they themselves narcissistic or clinically narcissist? Um, and one way to offer yourself comfort would be to remember the times that you did experience um uh, a deep sense of love, or you are, if you are, perhaps you are in love with somebody. Know, how do you know that it was love? How do you know that you did not mislabel something else? For example, yes. dependency. Yeah. Dependency is often mistaken for love. It's a problem with the with emotions because we utterly depend on self-reporting. The thing is that narcissists firmly believe that they experience highly intense love. If you talk to the narcissist, they're going to tell you, I love the way no one else can love. I love so deeply and intensely and profoundly that I doubt anyone else is capable of this. So they insist that they are capable of loving and that they've experienced love 
and that they are offering love, and that they are creatures of love and everything. They masquerade as borderlines, actually. But what the narcissist labels love is nothing whatsoever to do with love. Not even, it's like, not a Venn diagram where there's something in common. It's like two circles. It's nothing whatsoever. What the narcissist labels as love is love is a process known as narcissistic elation. It's um, an oceanic feeling of merging and fusing with a mother figure who then aff affirms the narcissist's grandiosity, the narcissist's perfection, the narcissist's lovability. So this is called narcissistic elation. It's the merger or fusion, symbiotic, with a mother figure. Or with a real mother, by the way. When the infant reacts to a real mother, that's narcissistic elation. And narcissists misidentify this as love. And when you dig deeper with narcissists, which I've been doing for 30 years, when you dig deeper with narcissists, you come up across paradoxes of thinking and so on. So they would tell you, uh, they, I know I'm in love because of the way it makes me feel. <laughs> you ask the narcissist, how do you know you're in love? Oh, because I've never felt this way. But wait a minute. Love is not about you. Love is about the other person. True love is about the other person. It's more about how you make the other person feel. Not yourself. Narcissists are takers. They measure everything in terms of give and take or take and take and performance. So and when the narcissist chooses what you might call erroneously an intimate partner, <laughs> I call them insignificant others. When the narcissist chooses an insignificant other, it's not because of who she is. There is this lore, self-aggrandizing lore, among the victim communities, the empath, so-called empath communities, uh, that they're special. That's why the narcissist chose them. They were chosen because they're hyper-empathic and they're amazingly kind and they're nice. and That's bullshit. Narcissists does not choose the partner on the basis of who she is. Uh, narcissists don't do empathy. They wouldn't identify empathy if it fell on their head. So, narcissist chooses you because of what you can give him. Narcissists are looking for sex, supply, sadistic and narcissistic, safety, object constancy, your constant presence, even addiction, I would say, to the narcissist. So, safety, and services. If you give the narcissist two of these four, sex and services, services and safety, any two, you qualify. You could be tall or short, dark or blonde. You could even be a psychopath. You could even be another narcissist. It's meaningless. They don't care who you are. They care you're a service provider. Like, I don't care who owns my internet service provider. I just want the internet flowing through my, you know, computer. So, it's a highly performative and or performance-oriented, goal-oriented approach. And the, but the victims feel so commoditized. They feel so marginalized. They feel that they've been so interchangeable and dispensable that they react with a narcissistic defense. They say, it's not true. I was very special to him. I was empathic, I was nice, I was kind, I, I loved him, I, you know, I saw through, I saw, the, I saw his inner child. You know, they try to make sense of what has happened to them. And what has happened to them is simply, they happen to be there, period. And they happen to be givers rather than takers. So maybe that's the only qualification. You have to be a giver or a people pleaser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Quick one. Are you hearing any background noise at all when, when we're in this conversation? The narcissist is coming. No, from my side. Nope. Okay, cool. Um, I have a, a builder in doing some work. Okay, so... Um, no, nothing. Nothing comes through. It's coming through. That's fantastic. Okay, let's talk about combating the narcissist. Now, I don't know if you have seen this, but I've noticed a lot of stuff online how to manipulate the narcissist, how to fight the narcissist. And I'm wondering about, okay, well, is this a good idea, folks? I mean, what are, what are, what are we doing here? How to attack the narcissist, how to defeat the narcissist. How to torture. There's how to torture. torture. I saw torture something though. that, I, okay. What's your perspective? Narcissists are very gullible and extremely prone to manipulate. I mean, to being manipulated. 
They're very manipulable. Yeah. They don't have actual actual defenses against manipulation and, and, and worse. Because they consider themselves to be so superior, so godlike, so perfect. So no one can pull the wool over a narcissist's eyes because no one is intellectually superior to the narcissist. Mm. The narcissist is world savvy, is worldly, is experienced, is super knowledgeable. He's, so narcissists, the grandiosity of the narcissist is a cognitive distortion. Cognitive distortion in clinical terms means that you misperceive reality, simply. When someone misperceives reality, it's an easy target, an easy victim, and an easy mark for con artists. And, and so narcissists very often fall for swindlers and con artists, and <laughs> they're easy marks. Well, they would fall for flattery and... For example, for example. Yeah, love bombing. Flattery, get-rich-quick quick schemes. Yeah, they're easy marks. Mm -hmm. So... Actually, most of these videos are correct. I have watched, of course, my share. They're pretty accurate. It's true that you can do this to the narcissist. If you take into account that the mental age, emotional age of a narcissist is probably anywhere between two and four years old, I'm not sure it's such a major accomplishment to con, to con the narcissist, to manipulate the narcissist. I would be mm -hmm. ashamed of doing this. Mm -hmm. Um you're, you're manipulating or conning or abusing a child, in effect. No, it's a very bad child. It's a nefarious child. <laughs> it's a horrible child. But it's still a child. You're taking advantage of the, this child's naive, naivety, naivete, this child's gullibility, this child's lack of experience with emotions. Narcissists can be very experienced in business and politics and what have you, but when it comes to emotional processing, and so on and so forth, they're children. So yeah, sure, you can manipulate a child to do your bidding or to punish the child. Or to, and if you're proud of it, um, good for you. Yeah. Um, so what, how would you start then? What, what would you do? What would you do? Um, I, you're talking love bombing. Well, first of all, you'd have to identify someone as the narcissist. Um, once you've done that, then... Flattery, love bombing, that type of thing. But what would that give you? What would what would you achieve by doing that? I mean, promotion, perhaps. In a, in a... you can do, you can make the narcissist do anything you want. Mm -mm. There are two vectors of attack. If I boil all these two million videos, there are two two vectors of attack. One is grandiosity, mm. and the other is paranoid ideation, paranoia. So you can use these two vectors to manipulate the narcissist to make the narcissist do, and I mean literally anything you want. Literally anything you want. So if you cater to the narcissist's grandiosity, flattery is one example, but it doesn't have to be flattery. For example, you can pretend to be helpless. And by pretending to be helpless, you aggrandize the narcissist. You are my only hope. Only you can save me. Only you have the solution. You're amazing. I don't trust anyone else. It's a way to cater to the narcissist's grandiosity, which does not involve flattery, in effect. That's a, a codependence to this. Codependents often use this form of emotional blackmail. Mm. You know, I will die without you. If you leave me, I will die. This kind of thing. So this is a vector of attack via grandiosity. And another vector is paranoia, to create an ambience or an environment that would trigger the narcissist's paranoid ideation, fear, um, and would cause the narcissist to behave in ways which would be self-defeating or self-destructive even, if you want to punish the narcissist, for example. These are the two vectors, and a combination of these two is even even more. Like a combination of these two is known as paranoid paranoia or paranoid personality disorder. It's when your grandiosity combines with your paranoia, and you say to yourself, "I'm such an important person. I know so many secrets. I'm so unique. My skills are unparalleled. So this means that people are conspiring against me." This means that I'm, I'm at the focus and the center of malign attention. And so the paranoia feeds the grandiosity and the grandiosity feeds the paranoia. And you can construct a perfect scenario which would push the narcissist to behave in ways uh, which, are, which conform to your goal or your... And con artists do this. And, you know. 
But in intimate relationships, it's important to understand that narcissism is infectious, literally infectious. It's, you get infected by a process called entraining, where the narcissist verbally abuses you or verbally repeats the same message over and over again and ultimate, ultimately synchronizes your mind with his mind. And that is not a metaphor. The brainwave synchronized. It's been discovered recently in, neuro, in neuroscientific studies. So he synchronizes your brain with his brain via entraining. He creates a fantasy which is irresistible because, because it might cater to some of your needs or some of your fears and so on. So he takes over, he hijacks your mind. He takes over your mind. And your only defense at some point is to out-narcissize the narcissist. To simply become a bigger narcissist or even a psychopath. So we say in clinical terms that exposure to narcissism, pathological narcissism, triggers narcissistic defenses. And because narcissists traumatize a form of trauma known as complex trauma, trauma that is kind of regular and low-key, but ambient all, all the time there. So, because narcissists do this all the time, you, be, you, you begin to develop a post-traumatic condition. And as we know by now, post-traumatic condition, complex post-traumatic conditions are indistinguishable from personality disorder. That's why someone like Judith Herman, Judith Herman is the mother of the field of complex trauma. She coined the phrase CPTSD. Judith Herman advocates to merge complex trauma with at least borderline personality disorder. She says you need to eliminate borderline personality disorder because it's a form of complex trauma. And so the narcissist traumatizes you. Gradually, you become borderline. Your emotions become dysregulated. You, you're doing crazy things. You act out. I mean, you go, you go bananas. You're... After that, you become narcissistic. You push back. Narcissist tries to humiliate you. You humiliate back. There's competition. You're, you're more intelligent than the narcissist. Narcissist is more intelligent than you. So there's a kind of, you know, you become more and more narcissistic. Reciprocity and, going on. Yeah, and finally you become psychopathic. You become defined. You become, uh, um, uh, no, uh, reckless. You become, you engage in dangerous uh, behaviors. You lose sight of, of laws and regulations and rules and inhibitions. So the narcissist pushes you from borderline to narcissist to psychopath. And after the narcissist exits your life, you remain stuck with this for a while, luckily. It's a transitory phase. But for a while, you are indistinguishable from, from a narcissist or a psychopath or borderline. So that's why I say that narcissism is contagious. Um, when you're thinking about healing from the trauma, and you mentioned that you used the word trauma there, what steps would you recommend to start that process? Are you talking um, immediately... Booking an appointment with a therapist? No. What kind of self-work can you do? Yeah, I strongly advocate to do some self-work before you attend therapy. And the reason is simple. Through the process of entraining and other processes, the narcissist embeds in your mind, installs in your mind an app. It uh, puts places in your mind a voice, his voice, his introject. He injects himself into your mind. And from that moment on, he speaks to you through your mind. Not only that, the narcissist forms coalitions with other voices with the same message. So, for example, if you had a bad mother, a mother who kept telling you that you're worthless and you are stupid and you're this, the narcissist, her voice inside your head would create a coalition with the narcissist's voice. And they would magnify each other and attack you from inside. So... This voice is with you even after the narcissist has exited your life. If you were to attend therapy immediately, this voice would co-opt the therapy. It would take over the therapy. And actually, you, the therapist would end up interacting with the narcissist in your mind, not with you. So there are a few steps you need to take. They're all on my website. There's a, on my web, on my, uh, sorry, on my YouTube channel, there's a playlist titled Narcissistic Abuse, Healing and Recovery, where I detail all the steps and so on. But in a nutshell, you need to get rid of this voice and then 
you need to separate from the narcissist and become yourself again. Why is that? Because within the shared fantasy, you strike a bargain, a covert, a covert contract with the narcissist. He becomes your mother, you become his mother. In order for the narcissist to become your mother, he regresses you. He infantilizes you. He pushes you to become an infant, back to the womb. So when the narcissist is gone, you need to grow up again. <laughs> you need to grow up and separate the way a child separates from his mother. And then you need to individuate. You need to go through these phases by yourself. And only then you should attend therapy. I explain how to do all these things in detail, in great detail. There are, there's well over 50 or 60 hours there on this playlist. And I want to repeat it here. Just go to the playlist and, and listen to the sequence of, of videos on how to do this. But yes, it's a crucial point. Do not attend therapy before you have eradicated the narcissist's voice in your mind and you have separated from the narcissist. You are no longer an infant, no longer a child, no longer dependent. Um, you, I've, I've heard you mention before body language, outward physical identifiers of narcissism. What, 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 what would you look for? What body language would betray a narcissist, if you like? Depends if it's overt or covert. The overt narcissist is haughty. And to save all of us time, Donald Trump. So look at Donald Trump. That's the overt narcissist. He's haughty. He's contemptuous. He's exclusionary. He excludes people. Doesn't bring them to him, but kind of stands apart. Uh, he's mysterious. He creates an air of mystery or mystique. And he's presumptuous. So, Donald Trump. Female equivalent? Same. All these distinctions between male and female narcissists were very pertinent in the 1980s. But today, studies by, uh, by various, Lisa Wade and many others, have shown that women adopted a masculine identity. In 1980, women described themselves using adjectives. And eight out of nine adjectives were feminine. Caring, empathic, loving, affectionate, and so on. Sensitive, kind, sweet. Today, studies today, I mean, in the last 10 years, women describe themselves in masculine terms. Eight out of nine adjectives nowadays are masculine. Competitive, ambitious, a winner, tough, rough, you know. So today, there is no clinical difference between men and women in terms of narcissism, and I suspect in, in all other ways. So it's meaningless to us. That's why I never make these gender distinctions in my videos. And um, where were we? What were, what were we discussing? I forgot. Um, we were talking about body language. Ah, yeah, body um, language, yes. So it, it applies to women as well. When it comes mm -hmm. to the covert narcissist, this is really bad. Whereas the, you see the overt narcissist coming, mm -hmm. you know, you can't mistake Donald Trump for a humble, altruistic person, unless you are legally blind, of course. But the covert narcissist can put on a very convincing display or facade of humility. We actually have a name for it in clinical psychology. It's called pseudo-humility. He can put up a facade of humility of self-deprecation, of self-awareness, of cha being charitable and altruistic, of being a savior or a fixer or, or a healer, and above all, of course, of being a victim. That's the typical body language of the covert narcissist. He is slouched, he is hurt, he is agonizing, he is in need of help, he is uh, uh, very affectionate and compassionate, empathic is, and he, he communicates this. And I think the key is how ostentatious it is. So if you see an ostentatious display of positive traits, it's likely a covert narcissist. And indeed, there are new studies that demonstrate that social activists and people who engage in, in virtual signaling are actually dark personalities. In other words, people who have psychopathy, I mean, subclinical psychopathy, subclinical narcissism, and Machiavellianism. This is known today as competitive victimhood. So all these so-called victims and all these movements were hijacked 
by covert narcissists mainly, and some psychopaths and some overt narcissists. And these covert narcissists are pretending to be the victims. Victimhood is a form of entitlement, period. Regardless of how voracious it is, regardless of how true it is, you could be victimized. Everyone is victimized. I've been victimized. You've been victimized. Or if you're alive, you've been victimized at some point. But it doesn't make you a victim. Victimhood is an identity, not a history, not a personal history. So victimhood is very narcissistic. It's entitled. It's competitive. It's arrogant. It's self-aggrandizing and so on. But it also um, is re making a request of other people to change their behavior entitlement. around them. This is yes. the problem. Yeah, and you, you use the word entitlement. Um, that is a very good way to describe it uh, because if I claim victimhood status, um, it means everybody else has to adapt. Yes, you claim a right. When you're a victim, you make a we make a claim to certain rights. And rights impose obligations on other people. On other people, yeah. When you have a right, there's a, cor a corresponding commensurate obligation. So if you have a right, they have to modify their behavior in order to accommodate your right. So anything from political correctness, you know, correct speech, and you name it. All victimhood movements have lists of grievances and derive rights from these grievances, which impose obligations on society at large. This is a formula. And it's a narcissistic formula, of course. We should help victims. We should help victims, of course. We should help them with therapy, we should help them with the police if it's a crime. I mean, we should help victims. Society should be geared to help victims. But society should not accommodate victimhood as a lifelong pursuit or a profession. And no, victimhood does not give rise to rights, philosophically speaking. You as a victim don't have rights just because you have been victimized. The fact and that and just victimized. to be clear, we're not saying that there's no justification. Because no. you could be, could, you're the the crime, if you like, that was committed against could be perfectly legitimate. It could have been dreadful, but the the point is that you don't live your life as a, and you don't make demands on other people. It doesn't yeah. give you the right to make demands on other people. None. I know it's shocking, maybe to to modern mod, postmodern ears. But let me ask you about one thing then, so that one thing that jumps to mind. There is a debate um, about reparations, right? So you may see... Perfect example, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the so, Holocaust, by the way. The Holocaust industry, same. Yeah. So so there is a, there is, there is a comparison there. Um, yeah, it is. It, it, it's deadly ground to even discuss. But clearly the, the reparations issue... The problem with the reparations issue is that there's nobody alive today um, that can be that the repair can be done in, 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 when it comes to, for example, uh, slavery. Um, I'm, the Holocaust. There's maybe a handful of survivors left at this point. Um, when yeah. Vic, when an event of having been victimized, an event of victimization mm. is converted into a narrative, an ideology, a manifesto of grievances and rights, like the Declaration of Independence in the United States, which was a classic victimhood thing, you know, read it again. So when this is done, we are transitioning into pathological a pathological area, and also, to my mind, an unethical area. This is an unethical act. The fact that you've endured victimhood, the fact that you have a victim, uh, the fact that you've been victimized, does not give you the right to take from other people, because they may perceive this as being victimized. It does not give you the right to victimize others. You take one dollar away from me, I'm sorry, you victimized me. I don't owe you anything, you know? So, there are, of course, society should accommodate 
retributive, retributive justice, retribution. Um, restorative. Restorative, rest, is restorative justice. justice. Even yeah. retribution. Even retribution has, a, has its place as a, as a kind of a self-soothing, a soothing mechanism. And of course, money should should somehow change hands and, and so on and so forth. But that's between the direct victim and the direct victimizer. Anything that exits this circle is illegitimate, unethical, and reflects pathology. And when I say reflects pathology, it's based on studies. There's not some vacuum. Studies by Gabay in Israel, studies in British Columbia, studies in Taiwan. There, by now, there's a whole literature in the last um, four years. There's a whole literature about competitive victims, uh, entitled victims, how victims manipulate other people to take what to take away from them, all kinds of things, and so on. There's a whole literature on this. But uh, because it's politically incorrect, it doesn't gain the exposure which I think it should have gained. I think it's an, um, these are amazing breakthroughs, breakthroughs in 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 uh, circle, and they're brave. These people are brave. Really, it takes bravery. I mean, it takes courage. You could lose your job over over such things. Yes. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, um, what what do you feel about a narcissist's um, propensity to change? Right, themselves without treatment, without an intervention. Um, say they identify themselves as narcissistic and they identify narcissistic traits. How would they change? Would they change? Would they want to change? What's your perspective on that question? So we must distinguish between antisocial, the antisocial dimension of narcissism, which exists in with majority of narcissists in a very pronounced way among psychopathic narcissists, but exists in all narcissists. The antisocial dimension aspect ameliorates with age. That is almost inexorable. And nothing needs to be done. It simply vanishes on its own. Narcissists are far less criminal, uh, criminalized in late age. By the way, psychopaths as well. Uh, narcissists are far less antisocial, far less abrasive, more accommodating, etc. So this happens, the social aspect of narcissism the ability to function within society in ways which are not harmful or deleterious to other people, this takes care of itself. However, the core is immutable to death, the point of death. And the core is inability to perceive reality as it is, cognitive distortions, grandiosity, fantasy. This is lifelong and it doesn't resolve spontaneously. And it doesn't resolve with therapy. And therefore, we should expect, accept that there are people like that. That's it. People who live in fantasy and think they're gods. And if you disagree with them or challenge them, they punish you. So, so better, really, better stay talking, clear. Yeah, we're, we're talking about managing them as opposed to confronting them or treating them. Well, managing them requires the manipulation, manipulative vec vectors that I mentioned, grandiosity and paranoia. Hmm. That's the only way to, to manage them. But I wouldn't even... I would attempt to isolate, not to manage. I would attempt to... I, when I started my work, in, and especially in 1995, I came up with a set of 27 strategies, and I, I, I titled them No Contact, which today is a very... No one knows that I invented it, but I invented this strategy. And uh, I still think it's the best. Uh, I think it's the best. I mean, no contact, simply no contact. Even if it's your mother, even if it's your son, or daughter, or whatever, no contact. Well, it is. It is. It, it is an ideal strategy, but it's unfortunately in the in the society we live in, um, it sometimes that may not be possible. Sometimes yes. you're you're, you're no. reporting, you're working alongside people, you just simply can't just. Yes, you know. that's why I came up with seven other strategies. Grey uh, Rock was one that. Grey Rock was, is not mine. It's not mine. It's, yeah. it's, it's the second most powerful strategy. It's wonderful. I regret that it's not mine, <laughs> but it's not mine. Um, can you give me another one or two? Mirroring, uh, you know, there's there's a lecture on, on my website, on my uh, YouTube channel, I'm sorry, which uh, kind of, it's a lecture I gave in Budapest, where I kind of delineate uh, the strategies and how the Nazis reacts, or actually how the Nazis experiences these strategies internally mm. and reacts to them. So, but if at all possible to go no contact, and very often it is possible. <clears throat> For example, if you're divorcing a narcissist, 
you can in, uh, limit the interaction to intermediaries such as lawyers and accountants. You can refuse to communicate directly if you are co-parenting with an artist. Yes. You can use safe houses or third parties to shuttle the child between the... You know, you can put buffers and partitions enhance and increase the separation gradually. Um, and when people tell me I can't go no contact because I'm financially dependent on a narcissist, that is something I do not countenance or accept in any way, shape or form. Absolutely. If you have a common child, I understand. If you, or if someone tells me it's my mother, how can I do this to her? I don't accept this. I don't accept this. This is about self-preservation, survival. Narcissists threaten your survival, at least mentally, not because they're bad. I've, I'm often confronted with the question of narcissists evil. They're no more evil than viruses. Or, and I make a distinction between purposefulness and intentionality. The narcissist is purposeful. He has a purpose, like the psychopath. He's goal-oriented, and the goal is narcissistic supply. But yes, so he has a kind of... Uh, game plan but purposefulness is not the same as intentionality the psychopath is intentional psychopath is intentions if he hurts you he wants to hurt you if the narcissist hurts you it's a byproduct it's a side effect he, he, he doesn't get off he doesn't you know it doesn't arouse him to hurt you the way it arouses the psychopath often so a virus a virus has a purpose viruses are very purposeful they go through, you know, protocol, they invade the cell, they convert the cell into a factory, they replicate it, and it all looks very intelligent. When we were fighting the COVID-19 virus, people were talking about the COVID-19 as if it was some kind of intelligent, sentient enemy, you know? But no one, in his right mind at least, would impute intentionality to the virus. And that's a narcissist. A narcissist is an automatic pilot. He's a programmed robot. I compared the Nazis to artificial intelligence 30 years ago. And I, I think that it holds, the simile holds. It's a form of artificial intelligence. Now today when we confront or we come across or interact with artificial intelligence online, <clears throat> many of us have a feeling that our interlocutor is a human being, intentional and this and that. Of course it's not, it's a program. A program out of control sometimes, but it's a program. And the same with the Nazis. It's a machine. It's a robot programmed by bad mothers, bad fathers, to take on the world in highly specific ways. Actually, narcissists are very rigid and constricted. They're unable to extemporize and improvise. They are highly predictable <laughs> because they are... They are, so there were debates in philosophy in the 18th century. Do animals have awareness, consciousness, or are they machines? And many philosophers said animals appear to be conscious and so on, but they're actually machines. They're pre-programmed machines. And many pet owners would disagree. But we, when we come to the narcissist, I insist on this. It's a pre-programmed machine. It's a highly sophisticated, complex machine that gives the erroneous impression of being a human being. It's a simulation. It's a great simulation of a human being. And in 1970, there was a roboticist, Masahiro Mori, a Japanese. And he said that the time will come when we're going to have robots indistinguishable from human beings, androids. And he said when this should happen, everyone would feel ill at ease and he called it the uncanny valley reaction. He said, the closer robots will come to resemble human beings, the more and more people will feel discomfort and uh, ill at ease and so on. And this is the narcissist. This is the first android. It's a perfect emulation, imitation, simulation of a human being. And yet we feel uncomfortable. We something's wrong, something's off key. We often deny this gut feeling, this intuition, often because of social reasons or because we're lonely. 
and we want to have a partner, or whatever the reason may be, or because it's my mother or my father, or what. We deny this. But no one can deny really that when you're in the presence of a narcissist, something doesn't doesn't click. Something something is not right. Something doesn't fit, you know. And I have this this experience as a narcissist. I I I meet people, and I'm most I'm my I'm in my I'm most I am my most charming self. You know, I'm outgoing and I'm empathetic. I'm super kind. No task. And I see how uncomfortable they're, how ill it is, how uh, reluctant to engage, how reticent. How I, I see that I provoke this in them. And of course, if the other party is obligated socially, if the social expectation is, then they deny, they, they suppress this. They suppress it. And actually, they're forced to act. They're forced to pretend. They're forced to fake. They become fake. I infect, infect them with my fakeness. You know? This is social contagion of Nazi. Mm. That's a... Uh, that's a picture.